Podcast. This is Jessica Webster. And this is Sam Pogue of the Fitness Break Room Podcast. Sit back, take a well-deserved break, and learn about the journey that helps shape the most successful fitness professionals in the industry today. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Fitness Break Room Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Pogue, along with a new special co-host, my great friend and mentor, Shane Hines. And we're here in Chicago, Illinois, getting joined by one of our dear friends, Angelo Cisco, uh, owner and founder of O'Hare CrossFit and the head coach for Barbell Ethos. Yes, Thanks for sir. joining us. My pleasure. Dude, it's, uh, it's a true pleasure to finally be here in Austin. Uh, Shane and I both got to meet Angelo on separate occasions in, with the Barbell Business Mastermind. Mm -hmm. And uh, you guys met in L.A.? Yeah, I was in LA, LA last year. Yeah. yeah, and then we were in San Diego in February. Yeah. And from there, it just turned into uh, an instant friendship of being able to connect. And uh, coming out to uh, our big, my barbell mastermind, John Wolf, uh, was like, dude, you're going to love Angelo. I hope you really get to meet him. I hope you really get to meet him. And, you know, I sat next to you at, uh, at the table. Yep. Uh, and then you were like, Ethos had just launched, and you're just like crushing. Yeah. You're literally crushing. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh -huh. And then you're kind of doing your thing. Like, all right, well, I'll just sit next to him and we eat. Yeah. <laughs> right? and so then I went and sat next to you, and we started chatting. Um, but it was like, you know, once I started hearing your story, uh, mm -hmm. I thought it was so amazing. And, and uh, now that we're able to get this up and going, we're so excited to be able to have you on. It's awesome. Uh, and obviously, you know Jessica Webster, our, our other amazing co-host mm -hmm. and, and owner. Um, so it's, uh, it's just Great to watch the community all wrap around. Yeah, I'm grateful to be on here and share this with you guys and share everything with the certification this weekend. It's been amazing. It's been <laughs> That's awesome. perfect. Yeah, Angelo came out to the Ana Academy Foundations with Shane and I, which is why we're here in Chicago. Not that we don't want to come and see his lovely face every day because that would pretty much make my life 10 times better. <laughs> um, so, you know, as, as you guys get to know and, and you've seen with our guests so far, we really want to be able to highlight what uh, amazing people are doing in the fitness industry and share their journey and re really make sure that you guys understand that this, this industry isn't all uh, cherry sundaes and banana split cream pies or whatever they're called, and, and that there's a journey that goes with each person, and I think it's really special to see when, when amazing people are doing big things in the market uh, and to be able to share their story with you so you can watch their growth. Um, so maybe you can tell everybody a little bit about um, what O'Hare CrossFit is and, and uh, how it started, and then uh, we can maybe look at you know, how you even got to, uh, into the fitness industry. Yeah, for sure. Um, so O'Hare CrossFit, November 11th will be seven years um, that I opened this gym. Um, July of 2009, I started actually training people. Um, and we're a CrossFit affiliate. Um, but I like to think a lot of the things that we do isn't very typical of CrossFit as far as um, the programming and the coaching and uh, little different things that we've picked apart from physical therapy or all different worlds and now from on it and different things like that. I even caught myself queuing today from some of the things that we <laughs> talked about this nice, evening. Nice. Um, and so it's, it's more of a hybrid of all those things that I've learned and kind of just cherry picked um, what I think works best and what might be needed for our population and just adding it in there. Um, I have a wonderful staff here um, without them none of this would would ever work um they're the people that run the day-to-day -day stuff and they continue learning and growing and you know listening to me and being uh, as a crazy leader i'm sure isn't really easy <laughs> for any of them um so uh the team really makes everything come full circle um but it's been an amazing journey yeah very that's, grateful that's really awesome you know something really special about o'hare crossfit and and to the uh accolades that angelo is is not only a, a coach but a business operator is that he was able to shut down membership at this facility so he could really focus on the quality that he started delivering his members. And I think that's a really powerful thing for a lot of people to hopefully aspire to, to stop chasing the white rabbit running around, which is sales and, and new clients, and be able to really focus on the quality control mm -hmm. and being able to focus on the retention. Mm -hmm. And that's something, you know, I've been in this industry 10 years now and I've never heard of a gym like straight up just like, nope, no new members, we're just gonna execute higher quality coaching, better services to our members, and I think that's really great, so. Yeah, it, it came to a point last year, um, we were really fortunate in 2016 that we were already a solid like gym as far as like CrossFit goes numbers wise, but we had, um, it's kind of crazy to think that we had such exponential growth so late in our like career. Like you feel like most businesses have their like boom and then it kind of just rides out, but like 
we had that, and then we wound up having another one. And it got to the point, too, when um, I was looking at the staff and the quality and the size of the classes where it's just like, is more better, right? And I grew up in a world where more was better. Like, you ate more, you did more, you drank mm -hmm. more. Anything more equaled better, right? And I just was looking at what was happening um, as far as quality to our clients. And then also, too, um, for the team, it's, you know, to coach a 25, 30-person class with even two or three coaches is, it's a circus at one point. Like, it just becomes um, a game of maybe not quality, in my opinion, but just who's a really good DJ and who doesn't get hurt is like the win. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to deliver more than that. And so we just kind of had a, just a, you know, come to Jesus moment. And I sat down with everybody and let them know that this was going to be um, what we we're going to do. And it was right around, uh, right around that like September, fall last year, about a year at this time. And just said, we're going to just focus on being better. And uh, I wanted more quality. And also too, from a business perspective, just getting more members, I think people think is, is the game, but there's also a point where it diminishes, right? There's like the law of diminishing returns. Just getting more members mean you have to hire more coaches and it's a bigger circus that you're trying to run when in reality where the quality and the attention of what we could bring to people could be better and more people could be doing or benefiting from personal training and different kind of sessions like that instead of just making it this class circus that's like 10 classes a day so we brought everybody together and i painted out this vision and everybody was behind it and then we just worked out a couple of kinks and we're rolling with it now and we're pretty happy with it that's awesome and i feel like the culture here like i mean from the minute shane and i walked in it's been hey how's it going welcome what brings you in and and okay well let us know if we need anything if you need someone to help you move some boxes around or whatever to get set up mm -hmm. and it was they, I mean, they don't know who we are. They don't even really probably know on it outside of that you went to the seminar. Mm -hmm. But it was just genuine hospitality. And, and you can really see that in coaches, you know, that, that the, the owner, the, the coach, or the leader really has this attitude of servitude and mm -hmm. really installs that service is the way that business gets done. And it's not about just executing sales and closing down business. And not that that's not a factor. Sure. But your coaches were nothing but genuine and, and hospitable to us uh, walking in the door. So that's it's huge awesome. accolades to you. Thank you. Well, uh, and then even uh, going down one layer further with your members, and we walked in, and I'm sitting in the lobby there with some of your members, and the joke was that it came out, and Angelo was like, hey, you guys, you're not giving him a hard time or anything? They're like, no, we are entertaining him. We're taking care of him. We haven't even introduced each other. And it was like I was just one of the members already. Mm -hmm. And so to have that from you, from the leadership and the team, through the coaching, all the way down to the membership, and that your members know as well that, hey, they're not taking in any new clients, but here's somebody new. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even a question of, hey, what are you doing here? Because this is kind of a closed off. It was open immediately, welcome, mm -hmm. thanks for being here. So, yeah, it permeates all the way down. I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. <laughs> yeah. It's awesome. Now, it wasn't always that way. Mm -mm. I mean, so let's back up a little bit. As we, How did you even get into this? Like, you opened – I mean, this is a beautiful big space here in Chicago. Mm -hmm. What brought you into the fitness industry, and, and what even inspired you to take people down this journey? Yeah, you know, I, I, as soon as you uh, – we were talking before the show, and you mentioned, like, what we were going to talk about. And so I'm going to give it to you guys from the beginning. I don't think many people have actually – know the whole the whole story so this will be like I love it. an exclusive i hope it's um, as better as i hope it's as great as all the other stories we've heard from you this week <laughs> yeah for sure um so i grew up in a family um my father uh is a very strong uh figure and dominant man and uh he grew up and i think that uh, understanding how he grew up kind of paints this whole picture for, for understanding of him so he grew up um in the city of chicago and uh, he was very overweight and most of his life, uh, when he was younger, he would be bullied. And he didn't really have, uh, he had a father, a father at home, but he wasn't very involved in his life. And so my dad would come home and kind of feel bad and didn't have any uh, support to how to handle these situations. And my dad eventually became a larger man. He's like 6'1". He's naturally like a 240-pound male. So he's a bigger person, okay? And uh, he used uh, his aggression to deal with being overweight. And then once, uh, you know, somebody would, would try to, uh, to pick on him or make him feel bad about that or tease him or anything like that, um, he used, you know, being aggressive or even being violent to, to handle the, that situation. And, of course, when you're a 10-year-old kid and somebody makes fun of you um, for being overweight um, and you beat them up, all of a sudden you get a lot of praise and accolades for it. So that only reinforced his behavior. Um, and 
basically poured gasoline on it, right? I mean, that's pretty much what happens. And so he went through his life, and he was very overweight. Um, uh, at one point in time, he was up to like 400 pounds overweight, like very overweight oh, male. Wow. Um, and uh, he went away for 11 years when I was younger. And during that time, he completely quit smoking and changed his whole lifestyle and lost close to 200 pounds, like completely changed everything. Whoa. And uh, it was a major life shift for him. And during that time, I was also younger, um, probably around, like from, he was away from when I was five till I was 16. So when we would go and visit him, he would see over the years that um, I was gaining weight. And so um, at the time, I thought he was only picking on me for being fat, but it was basically him trying to not let me relive his, um, mm -hmm. his way. And then, um, of course, what kind of came with that is he gave me the tool that he used to deal with being overweight. So I grew up overweight, but when somebody would tease me about it's just like little, it's like young kids thing, right? right? Like if you're fat and you're a guy and you got tits, like you get made fun of. I mean, I'm really like, that's how kids are, right? Yeah. And so I dealt with it in the best way that I knew um, or what I was taught. So I was also very aggressive and violent. I mean, that was what I came from and that was all I knew. And that's what my daddy told me to do. And that's like the song that was playing in my head most of my life. Mm -hmm. And Meanwhile, there was this underlying theme that we just felt bad about being overweight too. Like we all knew that like, even though we handled it in the outside world, when we got home or when we had to try clothes on, it wasn't, uh, you know, comfortable. We didn't, it wasn't something that we enjoyed. And so, um, when I was in high school, my dad, uh, came home and I, um, I tried to do just about anything to appease him and lose weight at that period in my life. Um, any, anything from barely eating from, you know, like that was like the Atkins time and stuff like yeah. that and, and trying to constantly exercise and things like that. And I would lose weight, but I, it wasn't in very healthy ways. And I think too, it didn't come from a place of serving me. It came from a place of trying to please my father. And that was kind of most of my adolescence and through life. So there was this kind of painting this picture of this underlying theme of always like being overweight and being self-conscious about it and then trying to mask it with more confidence projection and then just being that. That was like most of my, my childhood and my life. And then when I was 20 years old um, at that time, I wasn't really over, uh, I wouldn't say obese, but I was a little bit overweight and um, I was in a bad motorcycle accident. Um, I was hit by a landscaping truck. Um, I have 10 screws and a plate in my left foot, and uh, I have some new skin here and here, and all this was put back together, and I was in the hospital for two months, um, Thanksgiving, my 21st birthday, and Christmas, like that whole year, like all that, and then uh, it was about five months to learn how to walk again and, mm -hmm. and go through all of that rehab, um, so that was like my late tw or 20 to 21, and then all in through there. Um, and during that time, you know, you're not really mobile, and uh, for me too, I grew up where if you're upset, you eat. So I ate a lot. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I gained a little bit of weight through that time. And that was how I spent sort of my early twenties. And, um, right around 2007, 2008, um, my parents split up and I had a really hard time with that, um, personally. And I didn't know how to communicate that to anybody. Um, because for so long I had, um, you know, you have this thing of your identity and my thing was, my parents may have been through many things and my dad went away for a long time, but my parents were together and I took a lot of uh, pride in who I thought I was during that. And uh, when my dad left my mother, I moved home to, to support my mother during that time. And my answer to, to dealing with that was to just eat. Mm -hmm. And so I got up to around 300 pounds uh, myself and through 2008. And then during that time, I... Um, you know, when you're younger and you you find out that your daddy's not dad and your mommy's only, you know, it, they're become mom and dad, not or parents, not one, you know, mommy anymore and stuff like that. I had a hard time kind of dealing with that, but it also really helped me to um, right around 24, 25, um, realize that it was about me serving me and not necessarily me trying to do something to make somebody else happy. And so um, I started doing some research and... Uh, my first, my first journey, I guess, re-entering healthy, healthy order of fitness in high school was just kind of like a bodybuilding kind of thing. And then um, it was Jim Jones um, before it was CrossFit. Oh, it was. It was. Jim Jones was first. Uh -huh. um, and then I found CrossFit after I researched a lot of Jim Jones and learned about their stuff. But um, 
know that was the time of the movie 300 so they actually started putting out more content than they they did in the like early or mid 2000s yeah. i would say yeah and it just became a little bit more they had more videos but it was still very um underground at that point it was still fight clubbish um and so I studied Jim Jones, and then I found CrossFit, and then January 5th, 2009, I still have, like, the results. That was the first day I like to think that this all started, with what's here now. Um, and I worked out that day, and I did, like, a, a time trial test, and, like, I recorded the results. And uh, I was always very fascinated with programming because I feel like um, that's the art of what we do is, uh, is doing that. There's the science part, but, like, if you could bring somebody A to B, that's art. That's not just three by five good, Numbers, good luck yeah. Yeah. yeah and so i i was really obsessed with that and um from january 5th to 2000 in 2009 and then it was july i lost right around 90 95 pounds like it was complete transformation for me um and at that time i know sam likes the joke i had another business um where i uh a friend of mine owns a local pizza place and his restaurant's concept is there's 30 inch pizzas cut into eight slices. So they're giant slices of pizza. That's a massive piece of pizza. <laughs> and we, we, you know, we wound up doing this for fun once because we were just broke, but we wanted to be out. So we would load up the uh, catering truck with, uh, with slices of pizza that were just left over when the restaurant closed. And we would stand outside of bars and we would just hang out with people that were outside smoking or just doing whatever, the bouncers, everybody. And we would eventually, we started like selling pizza. It was just like something to do. And then, Lo and behold, like, you know, fast forward a few months, I, you know, I'm feeding a police district in the city so they can let us park <laughs> everywhere. And, uh, and that was just how it went. And we got a couple of trucks and I had four employees and, you know, I hope the government's not why it was all cash. You know what I mean? Like it was just how we rolled. And like, there was just, you know, they would leave envelopes in my car. I'd wake up in the morning, I'd go grab my envelope, figure out what we did the night before. And, and that was our business. So um, I had that during the time to, it was a Wednesday through Sunday kind of thing. So I had a lot of free time to really explore uh, fitness and research and learn and like understand things. And um, I started training people outside for free. I just thought it was so fun. I just was like, I'm going to work out. And people knew that I, I had this recent transformation. And uh, I was just training people like not far from here, maybe a half a mile. I've been in a mile radius basically my whole life. So it's all been in this area. Um, and then it was right around this time, 2009, it just started getting a little bit chilly, which it does here pretty quick. <laughs> and uh, I rented a racquetball court space um, and just made it a little a little gym. And there was like one, one to three on one, or three on one kind of sessions with me. And uh, we didn't really have much equipment, but we made it work with what we had, right? And if there was a time when we could buy something, it was like a big deal. Um, and then right around uh, the summer of 2010, I was like, what's next? Like, where does this, what's the next evolution of what this is going to be, right? I was like 26. I'm like, I have to start thinking of what I'm going to do with a career, right? And yeah. so um, we opened, I opened O'Hare CrossFit in November of 2010, which was directly behind this brick wall. Um, so uh, it was wow. a 2,500 square foot facility. Um, I really didn't know much about business because you guys probably saw when you were driving down here, we're down in an alley <laughs> um, with no, no street exposure. Right, yeah. um, but I just loved that it had garage doors and I loved that it was at the end of the street because I was like, I could do anything I want here and nobody's going to bother me. Yeah, I could blast music. I could, you know, we would, anything that were there. So we, we were there from uh, November of 2010. At this time, it was all me. I ran every class. Um, I had a BlackBerry. I, I miss those. Those are so cool. Um, I ran everything on a BlackBerry. I would answer emails, uh, you know, call people in for intros, do all that kind of stuff. Um, at that time, we were still taking, like, cash. I was running everything, like, on clipboards with pencil and paper, but it, it worked, right? I mean, it was just what it was. And um, right around 2011, I, uh, I stumbled upon my, my coaching mentor. His name is Jason Lydon out of CrossFit Milford. Um, during that time, there was very few, um, like, elite coaches as far as, like, programming was. It wasn't very common like it is now to have people that programmed online or do stuff like that back then. It was just a different different landscape. And uh, I emailed Jason one day, and we hit it off, and, like, I, I've i learned so much from him as far as, like, programming and periodization and kind of all that stuff. And uh, my first trip to CrossFit Milford was, like, a big deal to me because I, I barely had enough money um, to, to go there. And so I, like, I slept in my rental car and like you sleep in the back of a Jetta 
and then you're supposed to go work out for two or three days in yeah. a row, right? And like, I would just show up, and he was like, "How'd you sleep?" I'm like, oh, "Amazing!" And I like back <laughs> my 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 neck is like destroyed. <laughs> and I'm but, sure you fit great in the back of a Jetta. Oh, well, I was just like this, and this whole little Jetta. And I remember like, I remember texting my 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 dear friend who's been Dom, who's been very supportive of me. I'm like, "Dude, we're doing this. This is great." Like I remember like being like so excited that yeah. this was like the journey, you know, and. um and over the years, I've learned so much from him and everything that he's taught me about his gym as far as how he structures things and how he programs. And I just kept trying to bring it back here. Like, I just would completely openly steal what he was doing and implement it here. It was working there. I can make it work here. And um, then we started evolving in 2011 and 12, hiring coaches and kind of developing people like that. I had a very loose kind of internship program at that time, but the gym was buzzing and, and things were good. I was very... Uh, I was much more rough around the edges back then. You could ask some of the, the OG members if they're still hanging around later. Um, but I was just a kid that really wanted to make it, and I was scared. And so I just did what I knew how to do when I was scared, is just be ultra aggressive. Mm. And so that was kind of like the, the beginning of journey of it. But I think uh, a lot of people knew where my heart was, and that was the beginning of it all. And then uh, Becca, um, who you guys might have met, um, she is the first person I was able to hire full time. It was a very funny negotiation, um, but she was a, she's a very good athlete, and uh, she had a job that she hated. And I was like, "Well, how much do you make there?" And she told me, "I'm like, I'll give you that much if you leave your job right now." And she was <laughs> like, "Yeah." I'm like, "Perfect." And that was that was how we hired. That's how we brought her on full time. It was it was really slick. Um, I'm really ruthless when it comes to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> And so we brought her on, and that's when, um, when you know, anybody, I think, for their, when they're in a small business, the first person that they could bring on full-time, it's just that when they finally have somebody running with them. Yeah. You know Cause what I otherwise, mean? Yeah, because otherwise when you're working on your own, you're essentially on an island on your own. We talk a lot about this with, you know, our people who are going through our courses and mm -hmm. wanting to make a transition to being a trainer if they're not already, and just this idea of, oh, no, no, no if I'm the person, if I make, and it's like, no, you're on an island and you're by yourself and you need the energy. Even mm -hmm. just one other person makes all the difference being able to bounce and, and just uh, be a sounding board and keep you, get you out of your own head. Sure. Absolutely. It's, uh, yeah, she's been a blessing to have. Yeah. Like, and she's still here. Still here. Still rocking it. Um, all right. And then in June of 2013, we moved next door. We moved here where we are now. And this facility is 5,500 square feet. So it was a little more than double double moving at the time. Um, my personal opinion that this is as big as I would ever want to be. I think this is plenty um, to keep intimacy as well, but have enough room for everybody. Um, and yeah, it's beautiful. I really have a good time just trying to upgrade everything now. And that's kind of like where things are. Like we just upgraded the front area. Um, my next thing is sound. I've become really obsessive about um, the the breakout of group-based fitness in our industry, like not just CrossFit, like anything, on it, Academy, um, Orange Theory, and then last but not least, SoulCycle. Yeah. And um, I became really interested with SoulCycle, and I went and did it. There's a few in the city, and I just would travel, and uh, they have such a good experience with music. Yeah that uh, I think a lot of people might not think it matters, but it does. Mm -hmm. And so right now I've been, I've been working with a, a bunch of electron this electronic company and we're mapping out this like amazing audio experience that's going to be here at the end that's of this really year. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, it, just to just understand SoulCycle for me, it's almost like a trance mm -hmm. that people get so into their bodies, they get out of their heads and that's what they like about SoulCycle. Um, I just have not heard much direct feedback about the results. I've only heard that it's fun. Right. And that's cool. And so if we're delivering results, and that, that was probably more of our focus then, I also want to deliver that aspect if we can also. And so I'm going to make it bumping in here. Yeah, throw some awesome. raves on the weekend. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. But and sell some pizzas just outside. <laughs> For sure. I mean, might as well get it back <laughs> in business. It's like the Planet Fitness membership. Right? Yeah, it's perfect. Oh, grab some pizza, slice of pizza on the way out. Yeah. No, our friend uh, Ethan Marine up in uh, Dallas, uh, he left uh, Anatomy at 1220 and Barry's, and he moved up to start what's called Body Machine Fitness. Really, they just go BMF Fitness, okay. right? which might stand for, you know, badass motherfucker. Yeah. Uh, like but it's Body Machine Fitness, and they're very, they're very like Orange Theory Barry's, right? They've got like 21 treadmills, but instead of all being flat on, against a wall, they're stadium style. So it's like eight, 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 That's right? Cool. And then he's got a huge uh, flat area and like this huge like pull-up rig. I forget the name of it, whatever. 
it's called like a monkey bar system. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but he's like, man, you know what? I, I wanted to take it to the next level. And so I got a DJ booth in the back and I had this guy mix all my mixes. Because when you're like, it's one thing to have a good playlist, but he's like, when you're trying to get people to like, we're gonna drop into a sprint in three, two, and the beat just goes down. It's like, it's real hard to want to sprint versus like, you know, Montel Jordan coming on, this is how we do it. Then you're like, you're amped. You're like, yeah. you hit 10th gear and you're just flying, mm -hmm. right? And the music, and I, like, I'm not into EDM, but a lot of people really are. They love that, like, getting above 120 beats per minute, and it really, uh, like, it really speaks to you. And we mm -hmm. talked about that yesterday, our, our nervous system speaking to each other, and that's what music is. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be, you know, in the uh, hit style training, boot camp style training that's big, I think it would be really interesting to see how it uh, played out into a semi-private or one-on-one -on -one or group style training in, in a CrossFit type environment. That's all, I mean, I'm really excited to see how that works. Yeah, I'm trying to play around with it right now. I spoke with a local DJ and it's kind of going to be like the warm-up's going to be just something smooth and kind of like happy or just to give some some like just good brain waves and stuff like that. But I was thinking for the strength, it's, it's got to be a little meatier with the bass mm -hmm. and then the beats per minute go up in the conditioning and right. just trying to make that flow in every class so we're gonna we're gonna give it a shot it's my next project here very cool and is it gonna get stem through the entire gym or is it just gonna stem no through it's gonna be all independent speakers throughout the entire gym so we're in a weightlifting area right now if people are weightlifting and they need that experience it's gonna be this and yeah. then there's gonna be that one there but it's also gonna have controls where if another class is starting we could turn off the music in the front and we could keep the class going in back if, if they're running late or there's they still need to do their thing oh, okay. and then i'm gonna have something in the front area as well to kind of like set like a mood um when you're walking in of just like that and just getting people i think no matter what we're doing with movement it's it's about getting out of your brain into your body mm -hmm. and the more aware we are of our body the better it is so music is just the catalyst to bring people there that's i think it's so amazing you know given what we've been getting able to talk about all weekend that you're now looking at you know a cool sound system to integrate into your members because it's a cool experience for mm -hmm. them right and and it's going to cost some money to be able to do that uh you know and we got in here on thursday into chicago and we came into o'hare to see angelo and hang out before dinner and uh, in angelo's office he's got this medicine ball inside of a glass box mm -hmm. and uh, we're like oh what's the significance of the glass box can you tell everybody about that because i think it's the most powerful thing i might have ever heard yeah so two brothers um that that used to work for me they still come to the gym is uh, alex and louise and um they uh i have this medicine ball that was the first piece of equipment that i bought and uh at the time it was like a 60 or 65 dollar medicine ball and uh for me, that was a lot of money. Like that was like a big investment. Like you either bought a bunch of bands or you bought a medicine ball because that was like very easy to use with a lot of people. And uh, I kept it here all these years. And then uh, one year they they grabbed it and they knew they knew what it was or the significance of it because they've been here that long. And they put it like in that trophy case for me, and now it's on my desk. That's pretty cool. What's up, everybody? Jessica here. Okay, this seems like a somewhat natural break in the show to let you in on a few things. First off, we also have a video version of every episode, so if you're not in your car or you are whatever and you like to live dangerously, you can go to fitnessbreakroom.com to see Sam and I and our lovely guests recording in LA, San Diego, New York, Austin, you know, all the places we visit to bring you access to the break room. Secondly, we need to go in for an ask. I know it's early, but this is so important to the success of the break room. Uh, this might be more info than you want to know, but hey, maybe you're starting a podcast and want to know this. We need to hit at least 30 good reviews in our first week or so after we've launched, so it would be a huge gift to us if you could take 30 seconds to subscribe to the Fitness Break Room on iTunes and leave us a review. If that happens, there's a good chance we'll be showcased in the new and noteworthy section, and that's exactly what we need to ensure the podcast is off to a strong start. The stronger the start, the more time we can dedicate to bringing you these unique stories of fitness professionals that are just rocking this industry. If you could do that, that would be amazing. To make this ask a little bit more juicy, if you send me a screenshot of your review, I'll give you an extra entry into our monthly fitness industry night giveaway, where Sam and I pick one subscriber to win hundreds of dollars worth of fitness swag every last Friday of the month. This month, it's December 2017, is a huge assortment of Onnit supplements and golden earbuds. Fancy. So you can find all that information on our homepage. And thanks to Onnit, as always, you guys rock. Love you. If you haven't entered to win this giveaway, you can go to our website, fitnessbreakroom.com, to do that. 
And then you can email me your screenshot of your review on iTunes at jessica at fitnessbreakroom.com or you can hit me up on Instagram at Jessica Webster underscore and I'll give you that extra entry to win that awesome giveaway from our friends at Onnit. All right, that's it for me. Enjoy the rest of the show and thanks so much in advance for your review. It means a lot to us. It really does. For a lot of you who are just getting going in your career, you know, hopefully Angelo being able to share his transformation story speaks to you and, and what he's been able to build here at O'Hare CrossFit. Uh, but also that the significance of being able to buy a medicine ball, I think you know, it's really easy to get caught up and especially you know, we work for On It that, man, I want to get maces and clubs and kettlebells and the, you know, the Star Wars bells and all this cool stuff. But at the end of the day, it really comes down to service mm-hmm. and that the cool toys and the, and the medicine balls and everything are neat. But don't disrespect the journey that it took to get there and respect that when you're as an independent business owner or even a trainer and, and you're working for someone else, that, that's a really big step for you to move into a new space, buy a piece of equipment when you haven't done it, change your life, mm-hmm. um, you know, be able to change the member experience. Like That's going to be a powerful experience. It's different levels mm-hmm. right? because now you have a successful business going on, but it's, it doesn't uh, discredit you know, what you're able to accomplish because that speaks to like, man, that's something really cool I get to give back to my community because of what's been going on. Mm-hmm. So I think that in order to get there too, you know, it, it's not like, you know, oh, I have a CrossFit affiliate and all these people just showed up at your door or I'm the best looking guy in Chicago so all these, all these people start showing up. It took a lot of like systems. Sure. And uh, that journey, I think, um, is what put, maybe led you to the, the Barbell Business Crew and, and being able to be with Ethos. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is Barbell Ethos for people who may not understand what that is? Yeah, so, um, yeah, Barbell Ethos has been kind of my next evolution as a coach um, and, and being able to impact gym owners um, and help them with their business. So we we coach anybody that's in a group-based fitness model. So it doesn't need to be necessarily a CrossFit gym um, because at the end of the day, um, a lot of the group-based, group-based concepts are very similar, right? They're just, some of them are called a WOD and workouts and all that right. kind of stuff. So there's a little bit of lingo difference, but what we do is we look to serve and, and help gym owners kind of realize their dreams. And um, I had this conversation with uh, Marcus Gersey uh, a while back when I was first like getting into business coaching. And I said, I've never met a gym owner that didn't have a good heart or good intentions. Mm. Like we really don't get into this so we could be driving Bentleys and, 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 you know, traveling around the world. I've never heard anybody kind of with that. And it's just such a, to me, a noble, uh, a noble dream to, to want to open up a gym and really serve people, um, a gift of fitness because that's what it was for me and it changed my life and, you know, my desire to share that. And then you meet other gym owners and they just have these unbelievable stories too. Like everybody has something, a moment or a few things that happened that really inspired them. And so I got into business coaching and then uh, with Marcus and the rest of the team kind of sharing um, a lot of my thoughts on it, my views and my work that I've done with it. And we launched Barbell Ethos to just try to level up our industry and make people realize their dreams um, financially for them and make it a real legitimate business where it's something that works for them and they're not just slaving themselves to. And if we could be of service and, and bypass what it took me seven years to figure out, if they could figure out in a year, it'd be my pleasure. I think actually that's one of those things that's so important and learning for anybody that's coming, you know, you're looking at becoming a trainer or you're looking at opening a gym and you're looking at developing this stuff that, um, there's this weird dichotomy. So we live in an age where uh, of instant gratification. So the, even the idea of the medicine ball and that mm-hmm. it took like the 65 bucks was everything to try and get that. And now to think about, oh, well, I should be able to deck out my whole gym with everything just because I'm supposed to have access to everything and it can happen now. That's still not a reality, even though, you know, the Amazon Prime, you can go mm-hmm. order like and it's in two days and it's cheap and all of those elements. But that, so there's this dichotomy of living in an age of instant gratification. But then there's also the, so feeling like it should happen fast. And then everybody else who's obviously been through the experience going, yeah, no, it doesn't happen fast. Like it takes time. You got to go through the motion. So, but then that's the flip side where then those who have been through that experience and figured out processes and systems to make it faster that, well, hey, instead of making it seven years, let me get you there in two or three. Mm -hmm. Like, let's shortcut that process. And even though 
most people have access to something, whether through your services, through other education systems and whatnot, that as a trainer, you have access to that. It is still so many people don't actually buy in. Mm -hmm. They don't invest in going, oh, well, I want the instant gratification. I want it to happen fast. So let's just do it. Just make it happen. And yet the flip side is they won't invest in the part that will actually help them get there. Mm -hmm. And then it does become either a journey of a decade where they'll slog through and if they have either A, strong enough team members or B, just a strong enough connection of vision and the heart to be able to keep trudging through that, which a lot of us have gone through, um, then they make it or they cut out. And mm -hmm. what was it you were saying? Like how many for people who are going in to become trainers uh, and you, yeah, how many, what's like the percentage? percent attrition rate for, for, for people trainers. entering into the fitness industry within three months. Within three months. Mm -hmm. And you probably have some stats even just on the opening of gyms. What's mm -hmm. the percentage on that? I, we, we're still kind of early in our, our launching of like our numbers and things like that. I figure right now we're about six months in, so we're just about to start really seeing a, a bigger picture of data. I didn't want to take anything too short because um, right. it just wouldn't have been really accurate. But um, there's no arguing the amount of competition that there is in our industry anymore. And um, the thought of not leveling up early is not okay. Mm. If, I, if I had to do this again and did it the same way, I would have been out of business. Yeah, yeah. I just was at a different time where I was first here, and that and that was an advantage, right? But like now, if anybody's getting in our industry, most likely in your area, you're not going to be first, which is okay. But just realize that your your level needs to be above what's already there, at least. And I think that actually ties into what you're doing with this experience. So you were talking earlier about how in our industry and this idea of chasing the white rabbit like you're constantly it's always this feeling of i gotta get more members i gotta get more members i gotta get more members which does take a drain away from actually being able to put energy into those that you were able to brought bring into the door and have that retention mm -hmm. as you're going but if that's going on that really that is a big part of the differentiator is what you've just said is level up mm -hmm. so you walk in to the playground and there's all the other kids that are playing and that's cool it's not about necessarily even what you do different but how well you do it and if you level up how well you do it all the other kids want to go oh sweet well well i want to go like play over there mm -hmm. because it's a different experience um which i think is another thing that's really cool even just back very briefly to the sound thing mm -hmm. is that you almost all now have a control environment that you'll be able to see how does that play in to the evolution of the members of sure. the community because it's not going to be in flux of people coming and going it's like no we've got our community let's put this in here and see how it changes which is just something that ties back into uh what you're able to offer to other people looking to level up as mm -hmm. they're going yeah that's super powerful definitely I, I love the analogy about the playground, like playing well. Mm -hmm. um, I I find it in our industry more people are looking outside the door than what's already in the door. And uh, the best retention strategy, the best growth strategy is to deliver a great service. Yeah. Right? Like we went to dinner at uh, that restaurant Gibson's. Mm -hmm. I love that place. Yeah. They never have to call me up and ask me when I'm coming back there because every <laughs> time I go there, it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what you need to focus on, and that's what's going to fix everything is making sure that that steak sizzles the same way every day. And that's what the game is, and right. that's um, such a test of endurance. Mm -hmm. And a real that's where I think the real work is, is can you deliver that mm -hmm. same steak as best you possibly can every day? Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I, I really want people to realize, too, is that that experience that you're giving or your coaches are giving um, day in and day out is is what we're trying to really do. Everything else will fall into place after that. Mm -hmm. I think that's the first thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's uh, you know, where, where does that stem from? What does that come from for that for that success? Like, you know, maybe you look at a box that was open six years and all of a sudden they just start tanking. Mm -hmm. And is it maybe because the owner got burnt out? Is it because he lost all his his uh, coaches? Um, you know, what do you, what do you think that's from? More often than not. 
I think there's 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 obviously different cases for for different people and what right. they've gone through. Um, I think one is is getting burnt out is is a is a reality in what we do, and I think it's um, I think what I, I was telling somebody this the other day is I give passion two years without money, and then it's done. Mm. Like you could live you could live on passion for two years. I'm doing this. I'm playing. I'm the martyr. I'm making a difference and everything like that, but. After two years and you're and you're not succeeding financially, this industry is the worst. Mm. It's punishing, mm -hmm. and so for a lot of these gym owners, um, they they might not they spend too much time being zoomed in, which is which is a great thing to be able to deliver a high quality service, but they don't spend enough time zooming out to make sure everything else is working together to to make this happen from whether that be from a systems perspective, a hiring perspective, financially, like. All those different kind of things. I think people look at hiring people as, uh, as like, oh, I'm not going to get, this isn't my money anymore. I'm going to have to pay somebody to do this. And I look at it as this is an investment for your business yeah. and to approach it that way. And I think a lot of times gym owners, um, by the time they start realizing that stuff, they've already gone too far over the edge. And just you need to kind of spot that stuff as early as possible. I, I genuinely think if I, if I did this again, I could do it in half the time. Yeah. Like no problem. Yeah. Um, not only from, from what I've learned and experience wise, but just being more open to help. Um, like I said in the, in the very beginning about like my story, it was very like my back against the wall and everybody else get away. Like, and it, it just was, uh, it served me to a certain point and it does work. And that's almost like a sad thing when it does work, because then that's all you think is the tool. And then you realize that, uh, collaborating and helping everybody else just levels everything up, makes it so much better. Yeah. You know, we've, we've talked about this all a number of times and, and with different guests as well is like, it's really tough to make it. And, and like you said, you're not, you're probably not driving a Bentley as a trainer, as a local trainer, right? I and mean, even the celebrity trainers you see on Instagram. Um, and you know, when you start looking at the concept of, all right, I went from being a trainer and, and you know, fitness break room, like we really want to focus on helping you just get into the industry and find success. So that way you can like make money, buy a medicine ball, go to some seminars, like connect with some great mentors, right? And then the next evolution in your journey is, well, am I going to open my own spot, right? And then, or am I going to evolve my business? And that's where ethos and that's where someone like Angela really helps take over. And, and I've been really excited to have both of these guys on because uh, fitness break room originally started out as, is just an ebook idea. And we talked about this for a long time, just at on it and then when I went to the mastermind being able to connect with Angelo and and the crew there and and um, and talk about it openly with a lot of great leaders at that at that mastermind and then leaving God I think he texted me or Instagram messaged me or Snapchat <laughs> messaged me literally I tell these guys like once yeah. a week or every other day Angelo yeah. second how's the book coming what's going on what are you doing what do you need help on I'm like okay ah, uh -huh. I need to get this shit done um, but you know, it's that, that evolution and that, that journey. And, and, uh, I want you guys to know that just because they do business coaching, it's, it's so much different. And, and I was really excited to be able to have them on because, um, I want you guys to come and work with him. I want you to get your training business up and going so that way you can take the next step to come and work with someone like Angelo, because it's, it's really powerful. And, and honestly, like if we can help influence every person that comes through the fitness industry to be more successful, it changes the industry from the bottom up because, you know, you know, like what Barbell Business is doing and what Onnit's doing and, and hopefully what Fitness Business is doing um, or fitness, fitness Break Room is doing is that we're helping influence from the top, right, as well. And so um, hopefully just creating a better culture across the board. Now, with trainers who are having a hard time or even box owners, it's like, shit, I'm living paycheck to paycheck. I've got $100,000 in overhead a month. I'm, I'm sometimes barely making rent and paying my guys and I may not be pay, paying myself that month. Mm -hmm. It seems daunting to want to pay a business coach. Mm -hmm. how, what, how, do you tell, how do you talk to someone that's like, man, I'm, I'm barely scraping by as it is. How do I even afford a business coach? What do I do? Like, how is that going to help me going forward? Because it seems great. I'd love to pay for a coach. I'd love to have everybody coach me. But Yeah. It's funny you bring this up. Um, so I personally look at everything that you spend on yourself as investing in yourself. And I think you need to look at it from a place where you have to be confident enough that no matter what you're going to invest you're in yourself, you're going to figure out how to get a real return on it. Um, and that was me with the mastermind. Um, when I joined the mastermind, I remember uh, being on the phone and going to my friend of mine, I'm going, I can't believe how much this is. He's like, how much is it? I'm like, I told him how much. And he's like, are you going to do it? I go, 
I already sent the credit card. We're rolling. <laughs> <laughs> Praying it goes through. Yeah, he's, and I go, he's, I go, I go, bet your ass. I'm going to see it return on this thing. Uh -huh. I go, that all that mattered is that I had the guts to hit send or hit, hit process. <laughs> yeah. I go, after this, I go, you put, me, I'm going to figure out how to really make this the best for me. And I think looking at it from that aspect, if you're going to hire a coach, if you're going to do any kind of thing, if you're going to do a seminar, whatever it is, just know that you're going to be so present during that and you're going to make the absolute best of it and you're not going to allow it to just be like what some people do with gym memberships. Like they pay and they don't show up. They pay and like it's just kind of like that, that cycle for them. But just know that if you're going to do it, you're going to get full return on it because you're going to be so present and invested in what you're doing. And I would argue too is that if you don't really have that much money and this is a sacrifice in order to do this, you better be present. And you, you owe it to yourself to be super present and to follow any, anything that you can and learn as much as you can. Because to me, if your actions are different than that, then it wasn't that much money and that much of a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Same thing like Netflix. People don't cancel Netflix because it's more of a pain to cancel it than it is to give them their 12 <laughs> or $13. Right. But like if, you, if, you had a bigger, if you had to make a bigger in financial investment, I think that you should treat it that way with care and, and your presence and, and giving your full effort to it every time you do it or do some work with it. Well, I know that that was something that uh, there was uh, a number of years back with my own business that uh, had invested in some coaching and going through and there was uh, had gone to a seminar and then there was this additional like kind of mastermind opportunity mm -hmm. and uh, the gentleman that had been putting on the seminar uh, was talking about he's like I sit down with like anybody and I help them they start making money right away through their coaching and I was thinking thank God because <laughs> this has been a, like a rough road and I had a young family, so I'm trying to support a family while I'm trying to build a business and all of this stuff. And I go in there, and I am so excited. Uh, I like to think of myself as someone who does like has intention and is invested and wants, but just that small grain of, okay, somebody else is going to figure out the solution for me, and I won't like it'll make it easy because this has been so hard. So we get there, and we're doing it at his house, and there's like 10 people that are part of the group, and uh, we're spending the day, and all right, we're going to sit down and do this brainstorming and going through, and the, someone's like, yeah, this is my business. This is what I do. And he's like, okay, cool. And you want to think about that? Boom, boom, boom. And we get about two-thirds of the way through, and that's where I'm sitting. He's like, all right, tell me what your business is. And I'm like, this is my name, and like, this is what I'm wanting to do, and this is the vision, and this is what I'm... He's like, uh-huh. Okay. And it's, oh, uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm going to come back to you. And then he kept going and finished with everybody else, had something for everybody. And I'm sitting there going, I'm not going to get anything. Mm -hmm. This is the session. It's like lunchtime now. And we get up and we all go for lunch. I'm like, this is not going to happen, is it? And then we end up going and uh, the rest of the day goes out. I get to chat with him a little bit more. And he kind of is trying to drop some ideas. But he had no clue what to do with me. And... And after that, I could have been really pissed and frustrated and go, dude, like, what's up? But I realized very quickly that I was like, oh, man, Ed, this isn't meant to be, I'm not meant to be let off easy. It's not meant to be, oh, here's everything for you, and mm -hmm. I don't have to be invested. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's something that, especially when we're going through and trying to start our own businesses, whether it's our own training or opening our own space, you're going to hit those places where you're like, man, if somebody else could just do it for me, it, everything would be so much better. And that's the same with investing with coaching. You're going to get solutions. You're going to get the shortcuts. You're going to get all of this stuff that is going to make it, instead of a decade, two years. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that you're like, all right, I give you my money. Now you do it for me. Right. You have to be invested. Mm -hmm. You have to put that energy forward and, and stay connected. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. And in many ways, I think that that not getting that coaching in that particular scenario, not having the solution given to me was exactly what I needed because it gave me now the energy for the next two years of passion to be able to keep driving me forward and building out and eventually finding myself here, which I wouldn't have thought at the time necessarily yeah. Yeah. this is where it was going to be at. So I don't think any of us pictured sitting in like this kind of scenario, you know, when we all got into this, it sounds like we're all relatively about the same 
time, same kind of time frame. I was like 2008 when I got into it. Yeah, and I was around um, 2007, 2008. Mm-hmm. And like to think like when you're like, I was a 24-hour fitness, just like, oh, okay, well, this happens to work. I'm selling memberships, and then I became a trainer, and it's like, oh, it's going well. Literally moving to Austin to get out of the fitness industry <laughs> and <laughs> found a job at on it, and now I'm starting a fitness business, and it's like, huh, all right, well, whatever, right? Um, so what, what did you do? Like when you went down there uh, and, um, you know, get with Mike and Doug and, and the crew, yeah. Marcus, what did you do? to give yourself that intent to put into like how I'm going to get something out of this. Cause it's more than just showing up. Like sure. we talked about. Yeah. Uh, I go all in if, if I really like, you know, every meeting, every session, uh, any piece of homework, if we could have got on an extra call, I did it. Like I, I take full advantage of absolutely everything and I just leave it. No, like no stone unturned. Like, if Mike invited me out two days early, I book. I didn't even th- book the ticket. Like, yeah. you want to come to it? I'm in. If uh, there was an extra call, I could have been on with somebody. I I did it. If there was something, any anything, if they asked for more participation for me to help other people, like I did it. Like there was no, um, I didn't allow any and me to get in the way of anything. Mm. Um, I think that's the best thing is just being at a really aggressive action taker, almost to the point where you don't let yourself think about it. You just do it. And uh, I think that that served me really well in that whole process is just because I got so in depth with it so quick because I wasn't worried about um, if they thought I was a bad business owner or if they thought this about me or if I wasn't good enough or uh, all these things that like these fake ass judgments we give ourselves. Like if I didn't make enough money or if I wasn't successful, like all those things. And the, and the funny thing is, is that we're all thinking one one insecurity or another when we walk into a room, right? We might as well just let it go as fast as we can. And uh, I think just stopping all that thinking or it, I don't know if you could really stop it, but just stopping how much it allows you to slow down. Yeah, yeah. I think is the, is the game. And uh, yeah, I just like anything like that. Brought stuff there, would travel to go see them on extra different days and bring ideas to them and ask them questions. And, and anytime they gave me something to do, I just went back and did it. Like I didn't give it much. I didn't like weigh it out or wondered if this, and I just like constant action. I think is like if everybody did that more than they did about thinking about it or worrying, um, much better outcome for everybody. And I think it's important to understand too, like, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like for you as a person, like you're very much a listen, digest, like ascertain it for yourself and then maybe take some action. Like you're not necessarily worried about being like the loudest person, flashiest person in the room. Like, look at me. Mm -hmm. Like, that's very much me. Um, (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, I'm just going to say obnoxious fucking shit just to make you like, yep, I love to hear my own voice, so I'm going to talk. That's why I have a podcast. Um, But for you, like, it doesn't mean that you, like, to do all of that, it doesn't mean that you're, like, the most extroverted guy in the room, like, hey, buddy, buddy, like, let's go, you know, but it doesn't mean that you're not proactive, you know, and I think that, you know, having been at the Mastermind myself and being around a large group of seminars, you see people, mm-hmm. and you see the people, and, and it takes a minute to read them, and you see someone who might be quiet and sitting off to the side, and that might be them trying to digest and figure things out for themselves to formulate the right questions, or you might see someone who does show up, and it's like they are super intimidated, and they don't know where to go from there. Um, and I think it's important to realize that you know, getting out of your own comfort zone, yes, you took the step to be there, and now take that next step, that yep. bigger step to really put yourself involved and, and be open to being helped, which sure. I think is really hard for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. I it's funny you say that because um, I uh, if we're in a group or in in that I'm I don't want to say anything or you know maybe it's my own hang up but like I don't just try to blurt things to blurt things like I want our first interaction to be meaningful or I don't want to say anything to you right it's not the time for me yeah. and so I mean that that's been my my way of doing these things is to really try to just observe and kind of see where things are at and see where I could actually be um, of most service in that situation. And that's just my personality. And you're, you're a little bit more outgoing than me, which is awesome. And that's just kind of how you approach it. I think either way, what you just have to do is just dive into it the best way that you can, your version of what diving in looks like and not being too worried about if, because Sam's got, knows more people and talks to, it's just, it, it doesn't really matter what he's doing. Just do one step closer to what you really want to do and introduce yourself to somebody and just smile. Like it really doesn't take um, that much more to that. And just, I think also um, just thinking about how you could support somebody else instead of thinking about yourself makes that so much easier. Like what can I give Sam in this conversation mm-hmm. or say to Sam that would be of service to Sam? And then the, the, the whole context of it becomes different. 
Yeah, I think it's, I think that's uh, going in, and not that you're going into a conversation ever, like what am I gonna get out of this mm -hmm. conversation today, but looking at what you can give someone, I think that that's a really, I mean, once again, we talked about his attitude of servitude and just his staff and his members, but uh, going into conversations in that way, whether it's with a potential client, whether it's a potential coworker or someone you're gonna hire or someone you're looking to for mentorship or even friendship, right? What can you, what can you give that person um, and that goes back to the, this, the story we've been telling is, you know, at, at Fitness Break Room is being more like, let's all play, play well together. Mm. Like, let's, let's play on the playground together. And, and uh, it's not about, you know, one person being by themselves at the top of the slide, you know, O'Doyle rules and kicking the kid down on the floor. Sure. But, you know, how can we all coexist and, and make this all for the better? Because at the end of the day, like, I probably won't be moving to Chicago at any point in my life. It, it was on the docket before Austin, to be honest. It was New York, Boston, Chicago, and Austin. And I only chose Austin because I didn't want to be cold. Because uh, <laughs> I moved in November. And I was like, uh, yep, Austin won that one real <laughs> yeah. quick. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, like, you know, financially, like, if, if uh, like, Angelo and I never had something to, like, that we're going to gain financial means from each other. But that doesn't disvalue the relationship that we have. And, and uh, you know, even, like, you know, I don't have ethos as coaching. I don't run a box, but you know, like I said, texting me all the time. How's your book coming? What's going on? How can I help? Right. With only the goal of being of servitude. Right. And, and that's so powerful with your relationships as you guys grow your businesses and, and you guys grow as humans. I think it's so important and to find people that resonate and you're going to find people that don't want to connect on that. And some mm -hmm. people just need to hate others, but you going into that can really change that person's tone or that person's attitude by you going in with the attitude of, you know, I just really want to learn or connect from you. Like what, you know, and it usually takes people, takes people back for a minute because this mm -hmm. industry is very cutthroat. It is very like, bro, you're over there. I'm over here. Like we can't play. We can't even hang out together. We have different recess times. You're sixth grade. I'm fourth grade, whatever, mm -hmm. right? So I think that's a, I think there's a lot of really great nuggets for a lot of people uh, to be able to hear. Um, what's the next step for you now? Af you know, personally, O'Hare, right? ethos is going, you know, you guys yeah. are slammed right there. What's your next vision or your next goal for you? Uh, personally, I got engaged in July. Yeah. Woo! So we're excited for that. Um, so uh, we're going to be planning a wedding over the next year. Um, so that's going to be great. And uh, just continue to evolve. Uh, business coaching right now is probably my primary focus at this point as far as business-wise because um, it's still relatively new. And we just recently and, you know, just from my perspective, passed like the startup phase. And now it's time to level things up to where we want to really go. I think uh, when we first launched it, it was just like, let's throw it out there and let's see what's going on. And it's just, I think in any any startup phase of a business, that's just, if you want to grow fast, you just have to be open to taking those hits. Just do it. Yeah. yeah. And so um, now I think we're, we're getting past that. Now it's just a matter of leveling up everything that we're doing to make it um, make it the best it can be. And I'm, I'm really, um, for me, it's, uh, I have a deep uh, need to feel like very good at what I do, like very inside. Like I want to deeply believe that I am the the best at what I do and what I provide and service wise is the best. And it it, it drives me crazy, but I think it I think it um, it helps me more and not more than takes away from me at the end of the day. So right now I'm at that place with Barbell Ethos between our service, the coaches, the platform, everything, our our knowledge and even who we're working with as far as like helping with different outside uh, subjects and things like that. It's all about leveling that up at this point to where um, I'll drive myself crazy if I don't think it's the best, but I just think we'll move that needle in that direction. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Real quick, what, when is the best time to sign up for business coaching? Is it right when you first open your doors? Is it after you beat your head against this brick wall 97 times, which mm -hmm. your forehead looks pretty good considering yeah. I'm sure you've hit your head against it <laughs> for <many> sure. times. <laughs> uh, or is it like, you know, when things are just in the gutter, like you're about to go bankrupt and it's like, all right, fuck, this is the last thing I have, mm -hmm. I, I have left. What, what, when is that? Sure. Um, by far, helping a gym open up from scratch, like before they even had assigned a lease, is really gratifying that they're not going to do um, a bunch of the things that I did wrong. Mm. Like I opened up, and the village came and like put a sticker on the window because I wasn't I wasn't right for zoning or stuff like that. Like that's just honest, right? And I didn't have yeah. anybody help me with it. I didn't understand it. I just was like, oh, I paid my lease. I'll send you your money, and I'll get to rock and roll. And like being able to do that and helping them open up in better positions with members and being already past like their their breaking even numbers is like awesome. Like that's that's very gratifying. Um, the the person that's been beating his head against the wall. The only thing I would urge for them is 
be open to receiving and forget what you know. Mm. It's like forget what you know that doesn't work. Um, and I say this, um, and I don't mean this in any negative connotation, but there's a reason you you paid the fee. Just shut up and listen. Uh-huh. Yeah. Like you know, and, and I'm not saying that because I'm I'm looking down on you. I'm just I'm your I'm your coach and you're the student. Be a full student because I'm going to learn from you and who you are. But you have to be a student to what's coming in and not being um, allowing your your troubled past to to block anything that's coming at you. Um, somebody that's having a really hard time with their gym, um, we do we do encounter those situations, and I take those the most personal out of any of them. Those are the ones that keep me up. Right, um, and we do our absolute best to help them in any way that we can, and it's it's up for both of us to do whatever it takes to make it work. Mm-hmm. Um, and we give them everything that uh, we possibly can to do that. Those are by far like the hardest clients for me personally because I I want to help them so much, um, and we try our very best to bring them to what we can as fast as we possibly can, as quick. It's just a, it's it's a tougher that by far is the toughest battle. Um, when there's that immediate urgency where we can't uh, build the foundation. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there's it, that's what I would say is, like, if you were any of those avatars, that's where you just have to be. If you're new, just let's get some visioning things down. Let's figure out where you're at. If you're a little bit beat up, you have to just let go of everything that you thought you knew and just be open to things. Much like at your certification that I love, it's like, this is the way some people do it, but this is the way we do it. Like it, we totally appreciate other way other people do it, but this is our way right now. So please do this way right now. And I really love that. It's like forget about what you know and just be open to it. like like they call it a beginner's mind, right? Then just soak it all in and take it from zero. And uh, yeah, it's been amazing. It's so it's a very gratifying across any spectrum to help people this way. That's awesome. Especially something that um that's given me so much. Like if you would have told me when i was a teenager or in my early 20s that this would have been my life i would have told you you're, you I don't, get the fuck out of here like you know what i mean and so it's been such a major part of my life growing as is a as a man more than just business you know what i mean and so if i could share that with somebody and and help them do that i think that that's very gratifying for me it's that's the best thing i could do in this world mm. that's awesome i really hope a lot of you guys you know and we in that jessica and i can be a part of your journey and and uh really help get you guys to the point because being a successful trainer and then transitioning into the ownership piece, you know, as we've talked about and you've heard me say before, is, is a whole different ballgame. And it's not right for every single person, um, but it is very rewarding. And I hope that you guys get the opportunity to be able to work with Angelo at some point. Uh, something that we always wrap up uh, every single podcast with is, uh, what's your piece of advice for a brand new trainer getting into the industry? I just got my CrossFit level one. I just got my NASM. What's some easy an easy nugget for them to take with them uh, that, to help make them successful. Continue uh, a personal practice mm. um, for yourself physically, mentally, and spiritually. I think uh, that is the game. Just like they, uh, they say when you get on an airplane, um, put your mask on first. Um, I think it's really easy when you start getting in our industry to be worried about putting masks on everyone else that you don't put your mask on first and that results in poor service and poor everything. Yeah. And I just think that that's like the biggest thing. I've met so many coaches. I'm like, well, how often are you training? And they're like, not really. I'm like, well, there you go, buddy. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and so I think always making time for that. And and like I said, like spiritually, I'm not, I'm not trying to push anybody on some kumbaya stuff, but like, being self-aware and, and working on the things that you need to do to be better is only going to serve people better. That's awesome. Where can people find you? Sure. Um, yeah, so you can find me um, on Instagram or Facebook just under my name is Angelo Cisco. It's very easy. And then anything regarding uh, business-wise, anything through Barbell Business or Barbell Ethos. Um, and if you have any questions, always through like O'Hare CrossFit. You can find me here um, anytime. Awesome. Thank you very much for having us, letting oh, us pleasure. hang out in your space and, and being such a big part of, of this journey for, for Jessica and I. And, and obviously Jessica coming from the fitness, uh, the barbell business, barbell shrugged world, they, yep. they're friends. And, and uh, uh, it's been really cool to have the support of these two guys. And it's really special to have both of them on at the same time. So I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. And, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, all, the, all the notes will be in the, in the show notes. And I'm uh, looking forward to hearing from you guys again. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Sam. 
Thanks again for listening to the Fitness Break Room podcast, everybody. You can follow us on Instagram at Fitness Break Room. And if you're looking to enter our monthly fitness swag giveaway, you can visit our website, fitnessbreakroom.com, and all that info is on the homepage. Hundreds of dollars worth of awesome stuff, so I wouldn't miss that. And then you can even subscribe to this podcast on iTunes and leave us a review if you're digging what we're bringing you. That would be awesome and very helpful. Okay, guys, have a beautiful week. Stay strong and always look out for the little guy. Bye.